the state of Texas, when it comes to sexual cases or murder cases or any aggravated cases in general, all you need is a outcry or a testimony of the victim. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. You don't need anything else. And if a grand jury believes it, then you are going to trial and you're going to go fight for your life. That's terrifying. And so I end up getting indicted and I have to go to trial. I do think going into prison, our relationship got stronger when he was in prison. Like maybe it wouldn't have worked out if he didn't go to prison. I don't know. We, we talk about this all the time. We're like, I literally think him going to prison was one of the things that like kept us together today because we learned so much about each other. <laughs> The Emmy Award-winning documentary, Outcry, tells the true story of former Texas high school football star, Greg Kelly, who was falsely accused and wrongly convicted of arguably the worst crime imaginable, serving over three years in prison. He and his now wife, Gabri, have experienced what is most of our worst fear, the loss of freedom totally out of our control. Theirs is an unbelievable story of grit, determination, loyalty, hope, and ultimately love that can serve as an inspiration to every single one of us. Today we sit down to hear context and stories not in the documentary, hear about what builds such incredible character in both of them, and catch up on what life is like for them now. Here's part one of two. probably in a couple minutes, recapping y'all's story for those that aren't already familiar with it. But before we get there, maybe the only teaser we'll, we'll give is that you guys have a, a one in a million, I don't know, one in a billion type experience of uh, one of the most painful things that people could go through. And so um, before we even get to what that is, I wanna start with young Gabriel and young Greg and talk about maybe if we can find any kind of insights in like, who, who are you guys and where did the, the strength of character come from to prepare you for as much as you, you know, could be, uh, what you guys went through and to react and respond the way that you did. And so I'm, uh, we can start with either one of you, maybe Gabriel, if you want to yeah, go first. Sure. Uh, who is, who is young Gabriel? Where are you from? Where, what'd you do growing up? Yeah. Um, young Gabriel. I was born and raised in Leander, Texas, which is like North Austin. It's a growing town now. Um, I had two incredible parents. My mom was the dance team director of the Leander High School Bluebells for 25 years. Um, and then my dad was a leadership coach in Leander. And they were super passionate about what they did. They loved their jobs. They loved our family. Um, I had two older sisters who also danced. And I feel like I was just born into like a dance family. Like right away at two years old, I was dancing. Um, I ha had other opportunities to try other sports and other things, but like dance was everything I always fell back to. Um, and I feel like whatever I picked, my family was super supportive of. And I think that kind of uh, built me into who I am today. And, um, you know, my dad was always teaching me leadership lessons. And he was very, he was kind of like a coach to me in some ways. Definitely like my leadership coach and um, just teaching me valuable lessons all the time. And uh, they were both very passionate about what they did. And so that really poured into, I feel like, me and my sisters. Um, and right at like, maybe I'd say middle school is when I, knew I was gonna dance for the rest of my life and pursue dance and like maybe choreography or as a professional dancer or um, anything. Just I knew I wanted to dance. And um, yeah, my, my dad, you know, we'd go on these little daddy-daughter dates and he, it wouldn't be like, we're going to the movies or we're gonna go get ice cream. It, it would involve that, but then he'd be like teaching me a lesson on the other side of that always. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I grew up in an awesome family. I mean, I don't want to say it was a perfect childhood, but it was, I'm very grateful for my childhood. Yeah. Nothing really bad happened. And, um, I had parents who supported me in anything I wanted to do and sisters to look up to that were really good role models. There was no one in our family that like went off the deep end. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I had a really good childhood growing up and a lot of support. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we were talking about this, you know, I, if you're not from the area, like the Bluebells are a big deal. You yeah, know? And yeah, you were a captain of. And yes. If you're like in, anywhere in our district, Leander ISD, like everybody knew who the yeah. Bluebells were. Your sisters are successful and driven. Mm -hmm. But when I was asking, this wasn't like something that your parents like demanded of you. It no. wasn't like performance oriented. You were saying it was like this very like safe, supportive environment that lets you kind of go after what you're passionate about. Is that how you yeah. say it? Yeah. I mean, again, I tried like golf and cheer and all these different <laughs> things. and 
my parents were 100% behind me, but I went for, like, in middle school, I knew I was like, I want to be the captain of the Blue Balls. I want to lead. I want to have that family. I want to um, be a part of something that's really successful, but also I can, like, get creative with it. And um, so really, like, at middle school, I was preparing for that. I was in the studio for four classes every single day, Monday through Friday, and um, you know, learning these leadership lessons from my mom and my dad and my sisters who were captains before me. Both of them were captains. Um, so I was preparing myself at a very young age for that opportunity in high school, wow. which I did get and I got, I was a captain for two years of the Blue Balls for yeah. junior and senior year. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And that's cool. I just think, you know, that's unique to a degree because a lot of people that are driven and successful, there's this wounding or this pain a lot of times that comes out of um, and then when you hear stories of like, no, the safe environment, the supportive environment, for sure. like, you know, it's coming from that, yeah. you can breathe the same kind of freedom to go after what you're passionate about is, is really cool. It's encouraging. It's just unique to your story, but I love yeah. that. And yeah. then what about you in parallel? <laughs> yeah. Wow, what's, what's young Greg? So young Greg, um, you know, mother and father, I've got uh, three um, older brothers, um, actually four older brothers and an older sister. Um, but... Growing up, we, we grew up in the country, um, out here in Leander. We had a small piece of land out there. Um, I kind of just grew up playing, you know, soccer and football with the neighborhood kids that are on the same street as me, I guess you could say. Our houses were kind of far apart, but um, I, I also grew up in a, a very safe and comfortable environment to be an athlete. Um, both of my brothers were um, collegiate athletes. One of my brothers um, went to UT and played tennis and also uh, graduate with a kinesiology degree and, and the other one, um, you know, went into management of different department stores. And, and so, um, and I just grew up, you know, being that, that, that younger brother, you know, I had a lot of older brothers to look up to um, in a lot of ways. I mean, um, one of them went to go be a phenomenal uh, collegiate uh, track runner who won conference and got to go and, and attempt to go and run with Team USA in the Olympics. And so, just kind of growing up into my my uh, my middle school years, um, I saw his achievements and I was like, man, I want to be exactly like him. I wasn't as gifted in track as he was, um, but one thing I loved to do was hit people, and so <laughs> I loved playing football. I was a very aggressive person. I don't like hitting people in a violent way, but if it's a if it's a, a way where I loved uh, just going out there and being aggressive with anything I do, maybe it's just you know that that I don't know what it was, but. Um, it translated very well for me going into football because I feel like it was an escape um, from from just this pent up just you know desire to go out and just play the game, and so uh, I loved every moment of it just to get out there and put a helmet on and and go skill my uh, craft my skill, and so I was very fortunate enough in high school right um, to receive some 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 D one full rides to go play college ball. Yeah. At the time, we, her and I, we met in, in, in eighth grade. Yeah, um, math in class. Math class. Uh, we had was mutual that friends. Was middle school or was uh, it? No, uh, running brushy. Running brushy, okay. Yeah, running, running brushy, brushy. yeah. And it's so, it's so amazing how uh, the series of events that were prior to that, I, I jumped around a lot from elementary school to elementary school. Um, just so because my dad was getting a different job somewhere else in the city. And so we were moving and, and we actually moved to three different houses to kind of find a good fit for, for my dad's career. And so, um, but luckily we, we landed back here in the Leander area. And so if we didn't, hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have met her. And so um, we met in, in eighth grade, we had mutual friends and that's kind of how we got to know each other. And we started as friends and then we went to a water park here and kind of just fell for each other. Just tackling each other in the wave pool. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so it's the start of every great so love story. Cheesy, it's yeah, right? way full. Yeah. I remember, I remember, I remember one time she said like, "Oh, he tackled me," and he was like, "Oh, I might like him." <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that's how it started. I was like middle school, you know. Saying, yeah. There wasn't much thought behind it. Was like, yeah, I it's like him. And so, yeah. um, no. And then we went into high school. Uh, continued to date. Um, she did her thing that she was passionate about, which was being a captain of Blue Bell, and she 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 did it with complete poise and just desire and intention. And, and that's what I loved seeing about how she just did chase her dreams, you know, and, and her leadership. And, um, you know, I was able to be put in a position where I also led the football team at a, at a, at a junior year level. Um, and, you know, just doing my, my thing and I love playing football. And, and it, it honestly was the only thing that I felt like I was extremely good at. 
and I knew that it was going to get me out of, 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 of Leander and get me to college because I wasn't the best academic person. Maybe I just didn't care enough, mm. I guess you could say. Um, but Other I wanted to go to college. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't a priority, yeah. right? Yeah. And so as you mature, it does become a priority. Right. Um, and so um, I, we had intentions of staying with each other. And while I went up to college and she went out to LA, and we didn't know the struggles that were going to come with that. But right. um, like go, life goes, um, there's, there's, a, there's a turn in every, every yeah. step of the way. And yeah. we had one. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious, even right before we get to that, because... The, re- the relationship that y'all had before the end of your junior year yeah. like already had to be strong enough. Now, you've talked about like how that developed, you know, over the next few years, you know, with yeah. a multiplier. But already still by that point, like what had you already seen in him in, you know, your three or four years that you're already together at that mm-hmm. point that felt like this guy, I trust enough, his character, yeah. I love him enough, care about him enough. Like what, what was yeah. y'all's relationship like already young? Well, I think in middle school, the fact that we started off as friends first really helped mm. our relationship. Yeah. I think that makes the best relationships when you're sure. really like best friends and then you go into an actual boyfriend girlfriend relationship. Yeah. But um, he was so passionate about what he did, and I was so passionate about what I wanted to do. And um, I think we really support each other in that, and that's hard to find sometimes. Yeah. Like sometimes people are like, "You got to give that up," or mm. "You need to focus on me." And it was like, "No, I support you 100 percent in football and whatever you want to do." And he supports me going off to Los Angeles and. Mm. We had those conversations too about like staying together and you know we could still see each other every once in a while and there's space time there's so many ways to make it happen um but i loved how passionate he was and i loved how hardworking he was too like Mm. he was 100 percent all in and i feel like he also made time even in high school for our relationship even though we were so busy we were so busy but he even from like the background he was grew up in and um maybe not the most money, like he didn't have the financial ability to bring me on all these crazy dates or anything, but you know, he worked at the movie theater and he brought me to free movies every week. And, Part of the uh, reason why I got the job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and would come up with all these cute, like just, he went above and beyond for like our date nights and like little things like that. Wow, I just yeah. noticed like, this is hard to find, especially in a high school boyfriend, you know? Yeah. Um, he had a lot of great characteristics that I adored, yeah. so. I feel good to hear. I feel like you hear that from Absolutely. your wife. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's always great to hear that yeah. from your wife. <laughs> so then, um, so junior year, um, even before things get an extra degree of crazy, already things start to get difficult with your parents' health, right? That's one of the, maybe the first dominoes um, in this. What, when, what was the timeline of that? Your dad um, and your mom have medical struggles. So, um, yeah, so my dad... Um, just to kind of backtrack, trying to think, so much has happened. Um, my dad, my mom, it was my dad. My dad had a stroke. Um, it was actually Christmas Eve um, of uh, 2012. Okay. And so um, he had a terrible stroke, put him in the hospital, um, completely took out the whole left side of his body. Um, it devastated us as a family. You know, our dad was the guy um, who just, you know, he was the type of guy that would stand on the fence while you played football, and he would be that, that coach that's not supposed to coach you because you should let mm-hmm. the coaches do the job. Yeah. Like, that's the type of dad he was. He always had a cup of coffee standing there, and he would tell me what I needed to do uh, right when on coverage because he would stand in a way that, would, that he would see what I needed to improve on, and then he would also congratulate me. He was like, man, that's a great lockdown, Greg. And, you know, and those are things I remember about my dad. And, um, you know, he was kind of like the, the, the rock in our family as far as bringing all of us, our brothers together. And was he a perfect man? No, he wasn't, but I don't think any man is. And was there, was there you know, issues? Was there arguments and all that? Psh, absolutely, but the things that you, I can honestly say about him was that he was a dang good dad. Mm-hmm. Like everything that he needed to do, he did it, you know, and so, um, that happening to us really shook me and my brothers. Mm-hmm. And um, my, my mom ended up having some, some brain tumors shortly after that. She, I, I remember she was having headaches and she, was, she couldn't go to work a few times. And, um, and then a few, a few months after my dad had that stroke, my mom was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer. Wow. And so she was developing these tumors and it had to be operated on immediately. Yeah. And so that left me, while we were in high school, that left me in a situation where I, 
I had already uh, been receiving D1 full rides to go play football, and so I needed to continue to, um, you know, work on my craft as a football player, right? Get ready to go to college yeah. and go work out in the gym, go to school, make sure that my grades are on point. Mm -hmm. um, they're not slipping. And so I need to be put in a situation, um, a, a living situation, where I'm close to school, mm -hmm. um, I've got means of transportation to work and, and back home. And so um, <clears throat> that's when my, my, uh, my once best friend, um, one of my, I can't, couldn't call him my best friend. I had a lot of friends, sure. but I was so serious on playing football that I just had some really good friends, yeah. a lot of good friends, a good circle. One of my really good friends, um, his family opened up his, their house to me, yeah. right? My junior year, and uh, I ended up uh, moving in with them yeah. and to continue to be close to school and play football. And so both my parents, literally within months, yeah. um, got some pretty devastating medical conditions. And that's one of the things that struck me when I watched through the Outcry documentary is like, in that it's like, it, it's just a logistical point in the story. Like they just bring it up so that it makes sense of why you're at this mm -hmm. other house. And for me, I'm sitting like, for most high schoolers, that alone would have like derailed high school and been more that, that most high schoolers have to deal with mm -hmm. is you have the health of both parents and you got the weight of like now I have to, you know, perform in sports, have to perform well in school and you're like carrying the weight and responsibility of that out not in your normal home now. I'm like, if, if the story had stopped there, you would have had, you know, a difficult end to your high school, like, right. which was mind blowing to yeah. me because this is like, only like now the setup for what is to come. So that was just crazy. I was already impressed with all you were doing and trying to handle at that point um, before things, you know, progress further. But mm. so you're you're taking now you or you know you make the choice not to, to live at home but to be able to stay in the district, right? right. Um, and then your world is you know rocked and, and oh, changes yeah. forever from there, right? So if you want to pick it up from absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll try to keep it as short and concise as possible, hitting on the things that really matter. Um, yeah, no, I, I was living in that house for about um, eight months and it was being run as an in-home daycare yeah. as well from um, my, my, my friend's mother. Yeah. And at the time we're still dating and I'm working at the movie theater, I'm playing football, I'm going to the school, I'm not coming home probably till 10.30 at night. And um, I'm just, my, my whole life consisted of wake up, go to the gym at 5 a.m., mm -hmm. right? I, I only use that house to sleep. Wow. And so I woke up at 5 a.m., go to the gym, go to Gold's, get a workout in, then go to spring football practice. That started at, you know, 6.30 and go to practice those, you know, 8 o'clock and then get ready for the school day and then get a lift after school. Yeah. Uh, and then I have to go straight to work until like 11 when the movie's closed, right? And so <clears throat> I would come home, sleep, and do it all over again. That was eight months straight. And uh, I remember my parents were, were getting better. Um, and during that time in that house, um, my friend, the, the son of, of the mother who owns that daycare, um, he was kind of, I was seeing change in his, changing in his demeanor. He was using drugs. We knew that he was using drugs because he was getting caught with drugs. Uh, he, we knew that he was selling drugs because he had bags of marijuana and Molly and Xanax in his backpack. And uh, his mother caught him one time and, and, you know, gave him a butt whooping over it and just you know, grounded him. And, and it was very discouraging to see him ha that happening to him. But at the same time, living in that house, having all that's going for me, going for me, um, it's very, I, I'm kind of scared to live there now. Like, I don't want to be in, in a situation where something happens and I'm in the mix of it just because I live there, right? And so I'm, I remember uh, calling my mom and she's in recovery. My dad's, you know, he's, he's still doing bad. And I said, Ma, I gotta get out of here. I don't know, I don't know where to go. Uh, I just can't be here anymore. I don't feel comfortable here. Um, they, this, this place, I mean, I feel like something's gonna happen. I don't know, right? Jonathan's gonna get caught with drugs or something, right? And so um, my mom says, uh, just give me like two more weeks. I'm, I'm about to be out and, and I'm be able to come home and, and uh, we'll figure it out from there, right? And so uh, two weeks pass, she ends up coming home and <clears throat> I end up moving out. I had to go back home with, with uh, my mother and, um, uh, a few short months later, man, um, I get a I get a phone call right, at, and this is during summertime, going into my senior year. I get a phone call from my brother saying that uh, I'm being accused of something in that house, mm -hmm. and uh, and not just being accused for anything, mm -hmm. but being accused of doing something to a child. Mm -hmm. And when my brother's telling me this on the phone, 
I'm, I'm just, I kept saying, what? What are you talking about? Like, what do you mean? Like, which house? What are you talking? And I don't understand. Explain. And the first thing I told him was like, I didn't do anything. If there's ac- accusations coming my way, I want to go and clear them up anywhere. And, and so I end up, he ends up saying, no, don't come to the house. I'm going to go straight there. And we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get down to the bottom of this. And he says, just go straight home. And when I go to my car, I'm still kind of in shock, like what's going on? And so I'm immediately trying to call, trying to call him back, like what's going on, man? And he, um, he, just, he just kind of gives me the, the rundown about a father coming to the house saying something happened to their kid and that my name, Greg, is getting put in the mix, that I'm the person who did it, right? And um, I remember going home and like, I just started, I just, the worst started going through my head. Like I've seen documentaries of people getting falsely accused. I've seen people's lives be ruined, football players. I mean, I used to follow a bunch of these, um, like the Brian Banks story. Like I followed that one where it was like a false accusation of rape and there's absolutely no evidence. Like the worst is going through my mind. But then again, I'm like, kind of like feeling okay because I feel like, you know what? They're gonna do an investigation and see that I had nothing to do with it, right? right? Like, right. so I'm, I'm okay, right? I'm just gonna let, the system do what it does. Yeah. Little did I know that I became a target. Yeah. Um, you know, you have a belief that everything's going to be sorted out, right? That um, our justice system's perfect. That you know, we're America. We should have the best justice system in the world. We should have police officers that wear badges with honor and integrity. You you you're raised to believe this. And uh, a few a few short weeks later, I'm getting a. You know, I'm, I'm having to get an attorney because apparently the police are after me now. Mm-hmm. And I go have to go get an attorney and go through all these hoops. And all at the same time, I'm shielding her from this, mm-hmm. right? And I'm, because I, I don't want her to experience just the turmoil that's going through me right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm shielding her from it. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying my very best. I'm, I'm scheduled to go to a, um, an a- LA visit with him. Mm-hmm. I'm going on vacation to LA with him. And I'm going through literally about three weeks into this thing, and I can't tell the person that I want to tell the most of what I'm going through, what I'm going through. I can't tell her, right? I'm having my attorneys telling me to keep it quiet while, Gosh, while yeah. the, the police department do, does what it does. And so... Um, yeah, you went on a whole trip with me without telling... It's crazy. Like, he, we went to Los Angeles, I couldn't and he eat. wasn't allowed to tell me anything. And he was acting eat. so weird. Yeah, I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't think right. Like, it was, it was just a dark cloud yeah. over me. Yeah. Right? Because I didn't know... I was calling my brother. I would have to step out sometimes. Yeah, and I was like, I what think is she he knows, doing? Like, like, he's on the phone all the time? And you had, like, no No idea. Yet. No idea. Wow. And I kept calling my yeah. brother. I said, man, is there any, is there any, any word, any word, any word? Because right now it's just an accusation. It hasn't been on the news or anything like yeah. that yet. It's yeah. not even like an arrest. And yeah. I was like, is there any word that they straighten it out, right? Yeah. And he's like, um, and my brother finally tells me after a few phone calls of absolutely no news, while I'm in LA, he says, Greg, I, they're, uh, they're, uh, I think the police are going to press charges or they're pressing charges. And uh, he's like, when you get home, we got to get an attorney. And now I'm just like, I'm having a, I remember, I remember we were at a restaurant and we were eating and I had to walk back to the table and I walked back to the table completely empty. Like I walked back, like I felt like my soul was snatched from me because I'm, I'm in it for the long run now. Like I'm, I'm, I'm about to enter a nightmare. Yeah. And, um, we get, we fly back home and, um, I go see my, I, I, so Long story short, I'm really not trying to draw this out so long. No, I mean, we um, have time. Here to time. Yeah, yeah, we're good. <laughs> but I feel like this is a really important part is that um, I was recommending a, a defense attorney, initial defense attorney from the owner of the daycare. Mm-hmm. And that's really crucial if you watch the documentary because you'll, you'll under, there's this thing called conflict of interest mm-hmm. that we, we don't really realize until everything plays out years later. Yeah. How... Uh, how that was a very, and I can never ever say that the choices we made were in vain because I wouldn't be sitting here today if, if um, but what we think was the wrong choice then, it, it's, it's made me who I am right now sitting here. So I can't say that I wish I didn't go meet Patricia Cummings, right? Uh, because either way, my, my story, our story was gonna be written either way, right? How, how we like it or not, mm-hmm. right? It's not in our control. Um, but the choice that I made, to go see Patricia Cummings, um, it was a, a bad one, but uh, in the long run, 
um, it's, it's made us who we are. And so I... You would have thought you had more reason to trust her because of the connection, not for sure. less, right? I right, mean, right. Yeah. It was a connection there. I was like, okay, I don't know attorneys. I, or do you, do you right. crack, open a, crack open a phone book? Or yeah. I saw this guy passing down the highway, highway on a billboard. Do yeah. I call him? Yeah, that's what right? most of us would have done. Like, no <laughs> that's what, what makes it scary is like anybody would have responded the way yeah, I don't did. live. A, I'm not living a life that requires to have one on speed dial. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how, where to go. Yeah. And so I ask... Um, Shama, Jonathan's mother, and she says, oh, we got a great one, right? It's a great attorney, she's a super lawyer. I mean, I'm like, super lawyer, that sounds cool. I mean, okay, let me go talk to her. <laughs> and, uh, and so I go and talk to her and, uh, you know, we have conversations, a few days goes by, and then she calls me and says, Greg, come into the office. And we, we had already paid her a lot of money to represent me, mm -hmm. right? So much so that my mom had to sell the house we grew up in, right? We grew up in a, a double wide mobile home in, out in the country. And she had to sell that for cash in order to pay the retainer for Patricia. Yeah. So all those memories, gone. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sorry, it just tracks me. It's just, it breaks me when I think yeah. about it. Um, and I had to pay this retainer to her. And I'm like, okay, this is worth it because I'm fighting for my life now. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, she's a couple days later. She puts me. She sits me down and says, "Greg, um, yeah, we're gonna have to turn you in." I'm like, turn myself in? I'm not gonna turn myself. I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna turn myself in. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that you did it, or you're professing that you did it. There's just a warrant out for your arrest, mm -hmm. and you have to turn yourself in, or they're gonna come at football practice and grab you, or they're mm -hmm. gonna come into the school and grab you. You don't want that, mm -hmm. right? And so. <laughs> That very next morning, I have to wake up at 5 a.m. and put on clothes, mm -hmm. and my mom has to drive me down to the Williamson County Jail, and, and they go and put me in handcuffs in front of her, and I have to walk through these steel doors into booking and sit there and get my mug shot taken. And, and you know, I, uh, I, I thank God that, you know, the, the news didn't immediately catch it because there's TVs all over booking that you can watch the news on and stuff, and I was scared for my life mm -hmm. that that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm known for, for, for making these tackles and making these interceptions and, and getting D1 full rides on the news. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I'm going to handle mm -hmm. seeing, being falsely accused of mm -hmm. this on the news and then having to now deal with everybody's perception of me. Right. Right. And having to now go and shout to the mountaintops that I didn't do this. Please believe me. I'm fighting and all that. Like I had to go through that burden now. Mm -hmm. And so this is all just running through my head. And um, I don't get on the news immediately. I, I, I end up getting released. Um, we end up paying bond to get released. And they, they charge me with aggravated sexual assault of a child. And um, three days later, they, the DA agreed with the police department to um, upgrade it to super aggravated sexual assault of a child because of the age of the victim. That is not, that's never been done. That's a new law that has been passed and I'm the first person to ever get charged with that. In the world. Wow. And that means that whatever sentence you get, if you get convicted of that, which means the punishment is day for day in prison between 25 to 99 years. And so now I got that going for me. Yeah. And so I'm like, holy crap, man. And, and this is getting really serious and now it's, it's a living hell because that's now could be an, income, an end to all of this, right? So it's just, I'm not trusting anybody now because nobody's giving me yeah. any reason to trust them, right? Yeah. And I'm still going through this. And so um, I, get, I get released and uh, a, few door, a few short days later, uh, I remember um, getting out of pr football practice and I, uh, I go and have lunch with my mom and I'm refreshing my Twitter at the time and I, I see that, that KXAN news blast you now of my mugshot. You know, high school Texas football star Greg Kelly accused and arrested of super aggravated sexual abuse child, mm -hmm. and that's when I just broke. I just broke. And I went to the car and I just started crying my heart out to my mom, and I just I I was just so broken. My mom started crying and my mom was trying to comfort me and hold me and. Um, we end up going home, and, and then from there, um, they sent me to an alternative school because I got kicked out of the district, and 
I was being painted as a monster, um, so many lies in the media about me working at the daycare, just so much false information, mm-hmm. right? And just the news was just literally selling a story. Mm-hmm. That's all they were. And then I just felt like I was the, the sacrificial lamb, I guess you could say, mm-hmm. for people to make money off of me. And a month later, th- there's this whole investigation process. And you, if you watch the documentary, you'll understand that the, the detective while he was continuing to do the investigation after I was charged and, and went to jail for one night and got out, he went to go and step outside of bounds of operations, right, that he should be operating in. But he steps out and just poses a lot of red flags, yeah. right, for his how he conducts his investigation and does something completely unethical. Mm-hmm. And literally gets a second victim, forces a second victim Mm -hmm. to say that I abused them Mm -hmm. so it can strengthen his case. Mm -hmm. A second victim inside that household. And we'll find out later on when I get tried, I do get tried a year later, there's absolutely nothing. There's nothing here like, okay, what's going on? You know, is there a new crack in the case? Like, is there anything that that can prove that, you know what? Like, I didn't do it. Like, I'm literally like calling Patricia every week to see what the news is. Can I go back to my normal life? Yeah. That uh, that questioning of him, of that officer, like in the documentary was one of those, like, like you watch the whole thing with your mouth open. Like it, it feels like that would happen hundreds of years ago in some remote part of the country, like, not like here in Williamson County, Texas. No, non-civilization. Yeah, like, like the no, like, did you ever identify, like, ever show him a picture, ever in yeah. the same room? Why did you suggest, like, you were only giving him two, like, the number of things that you were just like, that, I wouldn't have believed if I was watching a movie, you mm-hmm. know, and I'm watching a documentary or something. Yeah, you can't make life. that stuff up. Yeah. Like, Hollywood wouldn't even make a movie right. around that, because that's, it's not, it's, they were not, like, that's not believable. It's not you believable. Can't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but somehow it is. Somehow yeah. it did happen. It was yeah. reality. Yeah. And those. And it's just literally a person that did not deserve to wear a badge. He didn't. He didn't know how to wear one. Yeah. You know. He didn't know how to conduct himself as a detective. Yeah. And when when that happens, yeah. right? I'm not saying every police officer is like this, but right. there are those people out there that do not know how to wear one. Yeah. And so um, when that happens, it ruins people's lives, many people's lives, not just the person that you're falsely accusing, but the victim that is, needs to have justice. Yeah. It ruins their life. Yeah. And so there's no closure for anything. Yeah. And so um, I, 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 a month later, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Leo, I'm in class. Uh, Leo is a learning alternative school here in the Leander Independent School District. Uh, for people that are in trouble or being, been accused and have to be separated from public school. And so um, I end up getting pulled out of class and get put in handcuffs in the hallway. And I, I'm literally asking my, the arresting officer what's going on, what's going on, and, and he's saying you're, you're under arrest for, for, uh, for indecency of a child. Like, what's going, why, who? I, 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 and so like, I, I literally feel like I'm in this nightmare that I can't wake up from. And I get put in the back of a police car and I get driven to the county jail and I get, go through this booking process. And it, it's, not like I, I, it's not like I hope that I'm not gonna put on the, I'm not gonna you know, look up at the TV yeah. and see myself. I immediately, when I was walking in there, the news was already on me, mm-hmm. all right? And um, they had to put me in a holding cell and I'm just explaining the hell of having to go through all these small little things that, that will literally break people, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I look back on it now and I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised. I've always asked myself like, why didn't that break me? Like, why didn't I have suicidal thoughts mm-hmm. because of everything I was going through? Mm-hmm. Why, you know, why, 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 why didn't it get me over the cliff where I just was, became completely insane, insane or developed a, a mental disorder or something, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, so just going through all of these small little adversities, right? And um, I, I end up getting out, and then I uh, get at the post bond again, another you know thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and uh, now it's just one year of absolutely nothing, mm-hmm. nothing. Mm-hmm. I'm living with my brother. I'm working out just to escape the reality and, and deal with stress. I'm sleeping a lot because I don't want to be awake. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm checking in with my attorney, what's going on. Um, I'm trying to hang out with her as much as we can, you know, just to feel human, you know, and have, feel like, you know, feel love. Mm-hmm. And 
um, she's dealing with her own thing too. I mean, she has a whole story about her having to deal with the the people attacking her and looking at her as, as standing by my side, going to school. And I, w I didn't see any of that because I didn't, I wasn't going to school, but I knew she was going through it. And so knowing that that's all because of me, she's choosing mm -hmm. to attach, keep, stay attached to me. Um, that's something I had to carry too. Mm -hmm. And so um, a year later I get indicted by the grand jury and I don't know how, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Being indicted by a grand jury means that there needs to be enough sufficient evidence to go to trial. Mm -hmm. And in the state of Texas, when it comes to sexual cases or murder cases or any aggravated cases in general, mm -hmm. all you need is a outcry or a testimony of the victim. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. You don't need anything else. And if a grand jury believes it, and if a grand jury says yes, then you are going to trial and you're going to go fight for your life. That's terrifying. And so I end up getting indicted and I have to go to trial mm -hmm. with Patricia Cummings my, as my attorney. Um, and yeah, yeah. I felt like I went on and on about it, yeah. but well, I'll just stop right there. Oh, yeah. Well, so then if we were to, you know, that same timeline for you, so, um, I mean, you, you do go to Lander your senior year, mm -hmm. right? You stay in school there. And yeah. as empathetic and understanding as high schoolers usually are, you know, and kind and all that, like, yeah. what, what was that span like even before you're out of high school? Like, what was that season like for you? Yeah. I mean, I think when this all first happened, he really did guard me from a lot of it, like when it was on the news. Yeah. So, like, when, out, when he was out in Los Angeles with me, I knew nothing that was going on. Mm -hmm. He went back home, he knows that he has to go turn himself in, and the first person he goes to, instead of coming to me, which I'm not mad at him for this, but he goes to my dad. He like literally knocks on my dad's door and tells him everything that's happening. He's like, I wanna to come to you first. And I think that like made me trust him even more because I respect my dad, and he knows how much I respect my dad, and he respects my dad. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that was a big, a very important part of the story because it made me trust Greg even more that mm -hmm. he like was so honest with my dad. That's a hard thing to come to a dad about. Yeah, <laughs> That's a very, very hard thing to tell yeah. my dad. Especially your girlfriend's dad. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You, want, you want him to think the world. Right. right? Yeah. I mean, like you want, you want him to think that like, you know what? My daughter's in great hands. For yeah. sure. You know, he's going to protect her. I'm, I'm going to him saying like, Hey, I'm being David, I know accused. you and I aren't the closest, but I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm being accused of this right now. Yeah. I'm fighting for my life right now. And yeah. that's the thing is they weren't super, super close yet. And the way my dad and my mom got behind him, uh -huh. I mean, made me love him even more. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, he calls me. I'm not even in town when he tells me. He's not telling me face to face. He calls me. I'm in Los Angeles still training to hopefully after high school go to the Edge Performing Arts Center. And he tells me the story. I remember I'm in the grocery store and he decides to tell me this on the phone. Mm. And um, I just remember like this numbing feeling that I get a lot throughout the whole story, like throughout our whole story. Yeah. Um, I didn't understand, I didn't really comprehend at the time, like everything that was gonna come with that. Yeah. Uh, I thought, you got a lawyer, she'll clear it up. We'll be good, we'll have our senior year, we'll go to prom, we're gonna have all these cool experiences. And um, it was summer, so I thought, okay, we got some time and then we'll clear it up before August. When school starts, everything will be back to normal. Like, I did not understand at all. Yeah. Um, I thought it'd be a month, maybe two months, and then you'd be back in school. But again, I mean, he was banned from school. So there, he was not at football games where I was like the captain of Blue Bells where I get to cheer on the football team and he's not out there. You're, you're watching from the gate. Like he wasn't even allowed on the premises at all. So he's watching his whole football team and supporting me from the fence. Oh um, yeah. And you know, prom, I was nominated for the court and he's not even allowed to step foot into prom. I'm not even allowed to bring my date. Um, there's so many things. Um, and then just that first day of school, going back and walking through the hallways and like everyone, I'm gonna start crying. Um, everyone just like whispering and <laughs> pointing and. Um, That's good. Yeah. Um, <sighs> it just was like a black hole. And that wasn't even the worst part. That was, it's crazy. That's not even the worst part. It just, it kept getting more bad and more bad. And um, I did have those friends that supported me. The guy that I think did this was at school and like kind of tried to replace Greg in a way, in a weird way. 
Um, yeah. You know, Greg was number two on the football team. This guy wanted to be number two on the football team. It's always like a tradition to hook pinkies at the end of football games. At the end of football games, that guy would come up, Jonathan, and hook pinkies with me. Or just like some crazy stuff like that. And um, it was hard for me because Jonathan was my friend, and you know, Greg's my boyfriend, and I don't know who to trust. I know who to trust him, but like then there's Jonathan where I'm seeing all these sketchy things, and I'm like, do I say something? Do I bring this up? And um, you know, I think people were looking for like who did this then? Like, if Greg didn't do this, then who did this? And I didn't want to turn in my friend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it wasn't true, I want evidence on things. And so many signs pointed to Jonathan at the time, and even more now that we know everything. But, um, yeah, I was just dealing with girls and guys, honestly, saying, like, so do you think he did it? Even my close friends asking, like, hey, um, I love you, I adore you, but do you think he did it? And I'm like, absolutely not. Like, there was never a time, even in high school or any time, really, um, that I was ever like, maybe Greg did this. Yeah. I never thought that. Wow. Um, but yeah, it was, it was hard facing the school pretty much alone because I didn't have him. Yeah. I didn't have him. And I, I had a couple friends, and obviously my mom and dad worked there, so I had their support in right. school. But yeah, there were so many things said. There was tweets about us. Um, there was, you know, you're dating a child molester, like just awful things, notes on my car. Yeah. But then there was this other side of people painting their cars saying, what was the hashtag? Fight Every, for GK. Fight for GK. And, you know, yeah. there was that support. So I think that really helped me even wake up every yeah. single day and go back to school and want to still go to public school. Yeah. Because um, dealing with that in classes and you just hear, like, conversations when you're walking in the hallway, like, oh, that's Gabriel. Like, she's dating the child molester. Like, yeah. and I just want to scream imagine. at them, yeah. but I'm not going to, you know? Yeah. Um, well, th th that's, like, for me, when you're watching the documentary, like, people are watching that, almost all people are probably knowing the outcome eventually and wondering like how it gets there. For mm -hmm. you guys, you are living it, not knowing how yes. this is going to end. You yeah. know? So for both of you, when you're falsely accused, when you're mm -hmm. wrongly convicted, you know, but for you to say like, okay, till he's 44, yeah. what, like, what was giving you hope, strength? Why were you like, nope, I'm staying committed? Like what, where was that? coming from or was like I'm just living yet every day like I'm just yeah. trying to survive the day like what yeah I I was always a positive person and I think that came from probably my parents like they definitely taught me that as at a young age to look at everything in a positive way yeah but again we've never had anything like this happen to us it was I grew up in a pretty awesome household with nothing bad happening mm -hmm. um but there was on I, and I still think I question it because I don't know exactly what it was that made me say, and I did say literally in high school, like I would literally stick by his side through it all. Um, and I feel like I'm still searching for what that is, but I, I must have been lessons that I learned when I was younger, the loyalty my parents showed, mm -hmm. you know, in their relationship, um, how much I loved and adored Greg. And I, and I do think going into prison, our relationship got stronger when he was in prison. Like maybe it wouldn't have worked out if he didn't go to prison. I don't know. We, we talk about this all the time. We're like, I literally think him going to prison was one of the things that like kept us together today because we learned so much about each other. Mm. So I, I wouldn't say I said I was going to stick by him, I guess, when I was in high school. It really happened when he went to prison. You know what I mean? Right. Um, like one, I, thing, one thing I saw, yeah. one thing I saw, if I can come in, is that you know, she, she believed in the fight, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the thing that tied us together was that she wasn't just sitting there and just hoping, yeah. like silently sitting on the couch and just hoping right. that the system would correct itself. She was boots on the ground. Like she was attached to me. You know what, like the video, I, I, when I got out, I was showered with like support videos and like videos from the rallies that I never got to see. Mm. I didn't get to see any of the stuff that was going on outside. But to just see like the videos, they made this whole video <clears throat> with the Christian song. What was it? Change, like we gotta make a change. Yeah, we gotta make a change. And they're like, there's different montage clips of like holding signs and, and going with the song, right, about me. Mm. And so I think them being dedicated to the fight, yeah. um, it, 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 she didn't like ponder on like, is Greg gonna get out till when he's 44? She didn't allow those thoughts to sink mm -hmm. in. You know, like, you know, trying not to be biblical, but like, um, you know, you know what I am trying to be biblical. <laughs> but, but, but to recite scripture, you know, like yeah. Paul tells us to take every 
thought captive yeah. and discipline it to Christ. Yeah. And so part of being a Christian is fighting each and every day and carrying your cross. And that's what Gabriel did, mm. is that she carried her cross and she fought, you know, mm. and she, she, taught, she took every thought captive mm. and disciplined it with the fight. Mm. And so yeah. she, that, that was in the forefront of her mind the whole time. So I don't think she had time to ponder like, should I suffer, should I, you know? So, and then guess what? I mean, after the fight, you know, after every great adversity and and you trucking through it with grit and just faith and hope and doing the work, there's gonna be victory on the other side of it. And I think just fighting that whole thing, I mean, it was six years of fighting, but it doesn't seem that long looking back on it because we were just dedicated to the fight. She was dedicated to the fight and now we're here, you know? Yeah, and one yeah. of the things I don't think you see as much in the documentary is what it cost you post high school as well to stay in that fight that you guys are talking about. I mean, you're talking about your cheerleading career, people, you know, teams turning you away, saying like, you know, change your name, I think it was. Yeah. Like, some of those stories yeah. were crazy. Yeah, um, so when he was sentenced for that, the 25 years, I was like, I was already fighting with rallies and you know, dance fundraisers and stuff like that, but I felt like, When he was sentenced, I was graduating and I felt like I couldn't go out to Los Angeles anymore. I needed to stay back and, you know, be present here, visit him every week and, you know, hold more rallies and whatever I could do back here. And he was honestly the one that was like, no, you need to go to Los Angeles. You need to follow your dreams. You can still come see me, um, but you've got to go after your dreams. And so he was like the only one. I mean, not the only one. There are other people, but he was the main one that was like pushing me to go to L.A., which again, made me fall even more in love with him because I'm like, this is incredible. Like, yeah. so not selfish at all. Um, and pushed me to go to Los Angeles. And I tried out for the Edge Performing Arts Center uh, where they picked two or 10 boys, 10 girls, and we trained for a year. Insanely, insane training, insane training. It's just every single day, pretty much from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. hardcore, the director's like, harsh on your appearance, harsh on your training, harsh on everything. And um, so it was already a hard training life. And, and I'm dealing with this whole situation with Greg. And um, I remember wearing my little, we had like these ribbons that we made. I'd wear it every day to class and to auditions and stuff like that. And um, it was hard to balance everything. It was very hard to balance everything. That's, I mean, I went through a whole thing with anorexia that's when it, I think it started more my senior year but it got serious when I went out to Los Angeles because I this whole Greg thing was out of my control and the only thing I could control is um, my exercise and what I was eating and my appearance and I felt like I needed something to control mm. and when my whole world outside of that was just so out of control and unpredictable and um, yeah it was it was extremely hard to balance um, but I I had him there, not physically, but through phone calls supporting me. We have thousands of letters. Um, and I think that's where I really fell in love with you. I mean, I was already, I already loved you, but I like really fell in love with you because like the physical was completely taken out of our relationship and we had to get to know each other on a whole nother level. I mean, there's no intimacy at all. It's just, it's words. It's words and personality and character and stories. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we have so many letters I look back on and they're so, you're, they're so detailed too. Yeah. Like the way we speak to each other, like six pages long and yeah. we get one like every few days. It's probably yeah. an intentionality of communication that most couples like don't we'll never experience. experience. Yeah. yeah, they'll never yeah. experience. So I'm grateful for that. I really am grateful looking back at, at that part of our story. Yeah. Um, and those 20 minute phone calls, I mean, you get literally 20 minutes to speak and then yeah. a little operator comes on and like, we're sorry, you have, or what is it? You have one minute left. I hate that chick. Yeah, she's like, you have like 60 chick. seconds left. And you're like, okay, 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 okay. New phone call. Yeah, new phone call. And, and it just, hang, like, you'll be mid sentence and it'll just, like, end the phone call. And you're like, ah. Yeah. And you can't text them. Like, oh, there's no God. other, like, ugh. But sometimes awful. they're like, oh, she says, like, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's awful. You know, when I was, when I was in prison, um, I learned something early on in my Christian walk. Um, you know, studying the Word. I got a life application Bible, and I, I, I just cracked open my concordance and just kind of read the footnotes to every scripture. And I got to land on um, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, right? Mm-hmm. And um, there's nowhere inside 
love is patient, love is kind, love is long-suffering, love, love, love endures all things. There's nothing in there that says love is physical. There's nothing. And so when I was writing her letters and I was calling her, I wanted to hit on every single part of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 and explain to her that my goal right now is for us to fall into a deep love. So when we get out, it's amazing once we get married. Like once we get married, that, that physical is just going to just explode because we're, we're doing it the right way. We're, we're, not, we're not having to go and see if we're, we're, we're physically compatible in order to now get to the kind, the love, the, 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 the long suffering and, and the patience, right? Yeah. Like we're, we're, we're learning who we are. We would, we would play 21 questions. Yeah. Like we would, we would know for real. <laughs> it's like literally awesome. all these games. Yeah. It's, it's so it's funny. Cheesy. Yeah. It's cheesy, but like I would, I would learn so much yeah. from her. And we were reading the, live love, uh, the five love languages together, mm-hmm. yeah. right? And we were asking each other all these deep 21 question questions, right? And sometimes I would have to reiterate six months later uh, the same question to make sure that the answer didn't change. Yeah. And so I was doing that. Yeah. And so when I got out, it, it, it was kind of weird to be physically there because we've been apart for so many years. Yeah. But at the same time, like we were thinking the same. You know, I, whenever I, I wanted to go get her a present because her birthday was coming up, when I got out, I got out in August, her birthday was in, was in October. I knew what present to get her. Yeah. You know, we went to Cabo in December um, and I, I, I asked her to marry me, um, you know, on the beach there. Um, I knew what ring she liked, yeah. you know? And so I, these are all answers that I, I asked. Right. And so, um, yeah, no, love, love, love does not start with, with the physical. And we, we, we're so fortunate, even in the most unfortunate series of events, mm. to find out what love meant. Yeah. Well, I love the order you were describing already in eighth grade, because that's, you know, meeting there, you'd yeah. built this friendship oh, before yeah. any of this goes down. Yeah. Then you get to know and connect on this level throughout those years. Like, mm-hmm. it's a, just a totally different order than what Completely. most people in our culture yeah. are going to experience, right? As, Some people as don't ever experience and it. I think, I, I think I was, you were speaking at, maybe it was DCX, I can't remember the order of the letters, the conference, you were talking about yeah, yeah. becoming maybe a little bit of a poet, like you had the, the Bible and Nicholas Sparks to read, basically. Oh, and some, of the like, best, <laughs> mo- some of the best literature ever. Yeah. Like, I'm telling you, <laughs> it, once you put sparks. two of them together, I mean, yeah. you, you're in This is your ammunition for your writing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, I'm about to blow her mind. <laughs> I got all these poems. I was like, Oh, is this? It's weird. You're like you're changing right from my eyes. 